E agora a gente vai falar sobre os desafios do investimento de impacto no mercado global. Gostaria de convidar ao palco David Wimborn, é, Portfolio Manager da Impax, e Mariana Oiticica, sócia do BTG Pactual. So David, thank you so much for being here to talk about uh, sustainable investments. So first, for us to, to start this panel, I'd like you to give a brief overview about the different definitions in ESG, sustainable investments, impact investing, and what do you do? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Mariana. Uh, great, great to be here. Um, so I think it's a really important point to start with because I think when people think about sustainable investment, responsible uh, investment, ethical investment, there's almost like this word porridge and word soup of different terms out there, um, which I think is quite confusing for investors. Um, the way the impacts approaches this is we define ourselves as purely a sustainable focused investment house. And the reason why we focus on this opportunity is to generate better financial returns. We don't focus on this area for any sort of ethical judgments. It's because we believe you can get those better returns by investing in companies that are well aligned with a more sustainable global economy. And I think as part of this, um, when you think about uh, that sustainable opportunity set, really for us, I think it's important to differentiate the difference between sustainability and ESG. Because for us, sustainability is essentially the what of the investment thesis. In other words, are the products and services that this company make well aligned with a more sustainable global economy? The ESG of a company is how these companies manage their material risks from an ESG perspective. In other words, have they got appropriate governance standards in place? Have they got appropriate human capital management standards in place for managing their workforce? And have they got appropriate environmental standards in place? And why I think that's so important, and you know, it really comes back to that point of material risks, my general observation is that generally companies cannot get away with misdeeds in the way they could have done maybe 10 years ago. Um, so if you think of kind of environmental pollution, you know, if a company maybe 10 years ago had a factory beside a river and the river suddenly turned purple one day, you know, there wouldn't be the, necessarily the, so much attention to it. But now, of course, we live in this age of social media. And of course, if that river does turn purple, those pictures will appear on social media incredibly quickly. And that will, you know, potentially causes issues for, for those companies. So understanding how those companies, if it's relevant, approach their environmental standards. And on the social side of things as well, understanding how a company manages its workforce is incredibly important. Um, I can say, you know, during the, during the COVID period, when the COVID impact hit global markets back in March 2020, what we really noticed was a very close correlation between those companies that could manage their workforces well and get them back to work, um, you know, in an effective way worth, versus those that, those, the, the, those that couldn't. Um, so really, that's the focus of um, the investment. Sustainability for us is the what of the investment thesis. The ESG is the how of the investment thesis. And very interestingly, there can sometimes be a disconnect between those two factors. In other words, a company makes products and services which are really well aligned with a more sustainable global economy, but it has various gaps in their you know, ESG profile in terms of how they you know, manage some of those, some of those risks. Um, and I guess just you know, sort of one, one example of this, um, maybe to bring it to life, is that um, I, I joined Impacts back in 2015 to help launch our um, global opportunities um, strategy. And the very first company I looked at back in 2015 was Tesla. Um, and I did some scenario analysis modeling on Tesla. And my, you know, my, my, my blue sky scenario on Tesla at the time was I said, what if electric vehicles are 20% of new vehicle sales in 2025? And honestly, it was sort of nearly laughed out the room because the most bullish assumption at the time was maybe sort of three, 4% penetration by 2025. Because of course the big bottleneck back in 2015 was the technology wasn't really there. You know, kind of the uh, charging infrastructure wasn't there, electric vehicles are too expensive and they didn't go very far either. Now, what I think is absolutely fascinating is we're now in a situation where, if you say look at the Chinese market, we have, you know, if you look at the May, uh, electric, uh, May um, auto sales data, over 50% of new cars were electric. Um, if you say look at Scandinavia, maybe 20% of new vehicle sales are uh, electric. It's the same in the UK. So it's just to the point 
that there's been this incredibly rapid transition in the automotive, automotive industry away from the combustion engine vehicle era towards the electric vehicle era. And we just think it makes pragmatic sense to invest in companies that benefit from being on the right side of these kind of transitions. So that's why we define ourselves as a sustainable investment house focused on some of the winners in some of these big transitions, the automotive being one. So it's not only about risks, but also opportunities, right? Very much so. And I think that's maybe how, um, how this whole you know, subsector of the market has changed over time. I think if you were to wind the clock back 10 years ago, it was all very much focused on sort of negative screening in terms of stuff you couldn't hold. Um, at Impact, we have no negative screening. Um, it's just that we positively look for alpha generating opportunities through, you know, through the way in which the world is changing. And how do you achieve uh, the, the returns um, and, and also tackle the, the social and environmental part? How, how, how you deal with those uh, two uh, theses? Yeah, so um, I think for us, kind of the financial returns should go hand in hand with the environmental and social um, um, improved outcomes as well. I mean, maybe if we stay on that automotive example for a second, if you think of the combustion engine vehicle era, you know, we're, we're still in that now and we're, we're exiting it at the moment. But if you think of that era, there were very large externalities um, during that time. So if you think of the growth of the automotive industry, it grew incredibly quickly over the last 100 years from the advent of mass production in 1920, I think it was, with the Model T Ford. That's great, and it you know, generated a lot of economic growth, but arguably while ignoring two of the big externalities of that growth. One, the impact on human health of us breathing in harmful gases from exhausts, and secondly, the impact on the environment from all the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. So really, if you think of that transition we've seen in the automotive industry towards the electric vehicle era, that economic growth has gone hand in hand with better environmental and social outcomes, which I think is, the, is one of the sort of key, um, key points to really focus on. Um, and I guess, you know, you see that across lots of different industries as well, um, where, you know, if you think of how companies, you know, are increasingly adopting more energy efficient technology, you know, they're not necessarily adopting that technology to save the world or for altruistic reasons. It's just generally for pragmatic reasons that you can save financial costs from doing that. You know, if you imagine you are, say, a, a trucking company and you, you, know, you have a large fleet of trucks which you know, um, deliver you know, products across a country, um, you know, if you find a way to adopt software to manage your route networks, you optimize that route, you can save a huge amount of fuel as a result of that. It saves your company costs. And of course, the nice outcome is you have a better environmental um, footprint as well from that company. So there's many, many examples like that, I think. And what type of investment opportunity motivates you most? Well, I think there's, there, there's quite a few interesting ones out there. Um, I think f for me, if you look at the global opportunities portfolio, what you'll see is that we have about 22% weighting in the healthcare sector. Now, I think there's some really exciting trends going across, you know, across the global economy. We heard about AI in the, last, uh, in the last session, but I think healthcare for me is probably on the most single, most exciting opportunities at the moment. And the reason why is because if you look at healthcare system costs and spending today, generally in many parts of the world, we spend a lot on healthcare with very, very poor outcomes. So take the US, for example. The US spends 18% of its GDP on its healthcare system. In Europe, uh, Germ in so Germany, UK, in France, it's about five or 6%, and we get better healthcare outcomes. There's a huge amount of inefficiency in that whole space. But what I think is really interesting is one little driver of improved efficiency is companies that enable better drug discovery. Um, so what I think is very interesting is the way in which drugs are getting discovered these days is on a much more personalized basis. So if you were to wind the clock back 10 years, I would say we were very much in the era of the blockbuster drug. And what that basically meant was if you had a particular condition, say a, a heart condition, you would generally buy a, 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 a drug um, product from say Pfizer or Merck or Eli Lilly. And you know, the, the inefficient thing about that was basically it'd be a blanket treatment for basically everyone. If we all had a heart condition, we'd all be getting the same treatment. Now, what I think is quite interesting is we're just at the forefront of the era of more personalized medicine. And really what's enabled this transition has been the fact that the cost of mapping the human genome, in other words, getting our DNA records, has shrunk from several hundred thousand dollars 15 years ago to several hundred today. You probably have a service in Brazil where you can send off your saliva sample and find out your DNA history. But what this means is basically the way that the big pharmaceutical companies are discovering drugs these days is much more on a personalized basis. And where we find opportunities um, in this big transition 
is really in companies that provide some of the equipment which enable that better drug discovery. So it can be uh, companies that make equipment which, which goes into laboratories to enable you know, the instrumentation to, to discover those drugs. Or it can be a company that has particular capacity to make bio, uh, biomolecular drugs, which is the big transition in that industry at the moment. Or you know, if, you, if you go work through that value chain, it can be companies that manage, say, clinical drug trials. Um, you know, if you think of a big bottleneck about bringing um, drugs to market, it's really that proving the efficacy on, the, on, on a human population. We have companies that are really bringing greater data-driven insights into how you manage that clinical drug trial process to hopefully bring more effective drugs to market more quickly, hopefully lower mortality rates, and then hopefully lower you know, systemically high um, system costs. But you don't invest in pharmaceutical companies, right? Why, yeah. why do, you, do you avoid that? Yes, so I, I think it's a, ge a general um, pattern with the way that we invest is um, generally we invest in the enablers of change. So, you know, when I mentioned earlier on about this transition from combustion engine cars to electric cars, we don't invest in Tesla, for example, um, fundamentally because, you know, I've, I've no idea which car company is going to dominate the electric vehicle paradigm in five or ten years time. It could be Tesla, it could be a resurgent Volkswagen, maybe Toyota is going to come through with solid state battery technology. I have no, no idea. But what we do know is that demand for things like electric vehicle componentry, autonomous driving solution, those kind of component demand will, will go up regardless of whether it's Tesla or Volkswagen or, or, or so on. So it's really the enablers and that pattern continues into healthcare where um, we don't really have any exposure to the pharmaceutical companies. Instead, we invest in those companies that enable better drug discovery. And generally, if you think of those um, pharmaceutical companies as well, we think that, you know, by and large as a group, they might face, you know, uh, increasing scrutiny over the coming years, really in two different areas. One is on the efficacy of drugs. Um, you, you're probably aware that in the US there's, you know, a tragic opioid crisis addiction where tens of millions of people are addicted to prescription drugs that don't really do anything for them. I think that's going to face increasing scrutiny over time. And then reason two why pharmaceuticals can be a tricky thing is, of course, drug pricing. You know, kind of, you know, you hear those stories of people driving across the border from the US to Canada to get their diabetes medicine because it's a sixth of the price. Those sort of drug pricing issues will sort of increasingly come to the fore. So um, if you were to look down the global opportunities portfolio, what you would see is that consistent pattern of investing in some of the enablers of, you know, of these big trends that are happening at the moment. Another example that you gave us earlier was uh, the food ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really interesting. I would like you to share with the audience. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. So um, we have and have had for many years now a significant exposure to food ingredient companies. Um, and what food ingredient companies do is essentially they provide the food compounds to the big food companies, the Nestle's, the Unilever's, the Danone's, to reformulate their food products so they haven't got so much salt and sugar and artificial flavors, um, you know, hopefully the same taste here, but with a better nutritional profile. Now, why that's really interesting is I think, you know, generally over uh, recent years, I think we've all been become much more aware of the impact on our health of the food we, we consume. You know, you see the increasing focus on ultra processed food at the moment. But I think the interesting driver, which has emerged very, very quickly over the last uh, year or so, has been the rise of anti-obesity drugs, you know, the GLP-1 type drugs. And what is interesting about that is it's la leading to changing consumer preference. Consumers are losing a taste for salty, fatty food on, on the anti-obesity drugs. And what that means is the big food companies, the Nestle's, Unilever's, and Danone's, have to put even more attention on reformulating their food products, you know, to, to make sure that they're aligned with changing consumer tastes. So again, we're not betting on, you know, Danone or Unilever or whoever it might be dominating that changed dietary preference. It's the ingredient companies that benefit, you know, across the board, really. Nice. Another thing is that when we analyze the market for the past uh, 18 months, we've seen, I mean, uh, tech companies having a huge uh, impact on the, on the returns, right? And you do not invest in, in those tech companies. Uh, can you elaborate how you can achieve yeah. the, the same returns? Ab ab absolutely. So, so I, I should say we, we do invest in tech companies. And in fact, we've got about 22% of the portfolio in, in technology, but we don't have so much exposure to the mega cap tech companies. So we don't have Google. Google, um, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and all those kind of all those kind of companies, um, and I think it's something we're really pleased with is that um, you know if you were to look at the now nine-year track record we have for the Global Opportunities Fund, we've generated strong performance without relying on those big companies which have really dominated market returns over most of that 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 period. Um, now, in terms of our approach to some of those companies, um, again, we don't have any negative screening in 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 the in the process. 
Um, but generally, when I look at that group of companies, I think there are maybe sort of three issues which may be a bit of a challenge for me. I think firstly, in terms of alignment with a more sustainable global economy, yes, some of them do wonderful things in terms of you know, digitalization and things like that. But if you say take the likes of say Facebook or Google, basically they are business models which are based on selling users' data to advertisers. You know, they, they monetize the clicks and then put the right and relevant advertising information in front of us. And it's my basic thought that over the next few years, companies whose business models are based on selling users' data to advertisers will come under greater regulatory scrutiny. So that's one bit of a challenge, I think. And if you look at the direction of, say, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the US, they are looking much more closely at some of those practices. Um, the second area why those big tech companies might be a challenge is actually on the ESG profiles of some of them. You know, the how that I mentioned earlier on of the, of the investment thesis. Um, so if you were to look through each of those different tech companies, let's say take Google, for example, one of the key issues with Google would be the governance structure. And the reason why is because if you buy Google shares, you own B-class shares. All the voting rights in Google are held by Larry Page and Sergey Brin. So essentially, if you buy those shares, you don't have any voting rights. Now, the reason why that's the case is because uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin believe that market participants are inherently short-term in nature. So why, why should they give away the voting rights to people that are short-term and don't think over the longer term? I have some sympathy with that. But generally, you would like to see you know, your, your own voice heard within, within that company. Um, and that, sort of that, that dominance um, of, I guess, decision-making within a company, you know, coming back to this point of governance, is sort of a repeated issue we see. You know, if, if, I, if I think of some of the biggest mistakes I've made as an investor, it's generally been through underestimating the importance of good governance. And there's, there's so many examples I could give on that where kind of the governance structure of the company has been a bit more of a challenge and you know, the, the company hasn't, hasn't um, uh, done so well as a result. And then the final factor about why those big tech companies are a bit of a challenge is really if you were to look at the global opportunity strategy from a philosophical perspective, it's very much a quality fund, it's not a growth fund, and it's not a value fund. And what that means is if you look at the, um, the, the, the growth rates of some of those companies, yes, they're growing incredibly quickly, but generally I have no idea if you know, some of that group of companies are going to grow revenue and earnings at 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, who, who, who actually, actually really knows. So I, I struggle to put a value on what those companies might be because it's very different from our focus on you know, quality companies, which for me, at its hallmark, is basically finding companies that are very consistent at what they do, rather than just huge, huge growth. Great. And how about the AI? What, what are the AI opportunities that you are uh, looking for? Yeah. So um, there are many parts of the global opportunities portfolio which benefit from AI. Um, and the way that I think about that opportunity is really in two buckets. The first bucket is the enablers of AI. And I used to be a, a tech analyst as well. And I can say that generally, when you get the diffusion of new technology, the first rush of excitement in terms of investor excitement is into those companies that provide the infrastructure to enable a big transition and trend. And of course, who are the enablers at the moment? It's basically NVIDIA with its GPU chips, and it's basically the data center providers who are providing kind of that raw computing power. But if I look through the global opportunities portfolio, we have about 22% exposure to what I would call the enablers of, uh, of the AI revolution. So this can be things like wafer fab equipment companies that basically enable the semiconductor uh, companies to pattern their chips in the way they need to be patterned. We also have software design companies, um, and these are companies that provide you with essentially the Lego instructions to design your own chip. Um, and then those chips are by and large made by TSMC in, um, in, in, in China, or in, in Taiwan rather. Um, so in terms of the portfolio, we have 22% exposure to those. We also have Microsoft, I should say as well, um, you know, talking about the big tech exposure, because you know, when I think about Microsoft and I compare it to some of the other big tech companies, at its heart, what Microsoft is doing is making the enterprise office environment more productive. You know, we can have calls from London to Brazil incredibly seamlessly. They're transitioning workflows to the cloud, which is much, much more energy efficient as well, if, if that's an area that we want to explore later. Um, so we have Microsoft as another one of the ena uh, enablers. So that's about 22% of the portfolio. We then, I think, have maybe the exciting, well, the even more exciting bit, which is the companies that benefit from the implementation of AI solutions in their, in their businesses. In other words, we've had this big investment in infrastructure at the moment. Now, how is AI going to deliver into the real, um, real economy? And so I was, I was giving you this interesting example earlier on. Um, in, in the portfolio, we have a very important company, um, not that well known, but for me, it's one of the most important companies in the world. It's a company called Lindy. 
Uh, Lindy is a US company that produces industrial gas. And what industrial gas is, is it's really sort of the building blocks of productivity in so many different industries. And it's a very, very simple business. Industrial gas companies essentially take atmospheric gas and split it into its different compounds. So carbon dioxide, oxygen, and then the trace elements. And those are used in different industries in many, many different ways. Now, I had a very interesting meeting with the CEO of this company quite recently. And the really interesting way this company is harnessing AI is when Lindy has separated this gas and put it into those big cylinder trucks you see on the, on the motorways, those trucks drive over one billion kilometers every single year, dropping off gas at customers in different places. Now, why this company is so interested in AI is if they can apply AI to optimize the route of those trucks, so basically it, 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 the most efficient way to do stop A, stop B, stop C, if they can save maybe two or three percent of the fuel costs for that company in terms of their route management, of course, it's a huge saving to the, you know, their, their, their cost base. And the very nice outcome of that is better you know, environmental outcomes as well. So in terms of the implementers, I would say the ones that really benefit probably maybe six, maybe 8% of the portfolio. So we have very significant exposure to that as well. And AI, I mean, uses uh, tons of energy, right, to, to process all the data. How do you see that in terms of ESG and sustainable yeah, investing. It's, 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 it's a really good, good question, actually. And um, you know, I, th I think this is one of the interesting things because AI is, of course, one of the big, you know, big trends we're seeing in technology at the moment. But the other one which sits alongside this is the transition of IT workflows from being managed on-premise, in other words, in a dark room at the back of a particular office block, to being managed in the cloud by, say, the likes of Microsoft Azure. Now, if we just stay, take the stage one, which is that migration of um, workflows to the cloud, cloud to, be, to be managed, cloud computing is a profoundly more energy efficient way of doing your computing. And the reason why is because it's basically aggregated computing power. You're taking the workflows from this company and this company and this company, you're putting in one particular asset base, and that means you have much higher asset utilization. So the figure that I've seen is that cloud computing is somewhere between 78 and 92% more energy efficient than on-premise computing. Now, of course, there's a second kicker to this as well, is that if you look at the way that data center companies are investing in the power needs to power data centers, obviously we know data centers are incredibly power, uh, power hungry. They all have very, very strong commitments to power their data centers by renewable energy. You know, out to, I think Microsoft is maybe 100% renewable by say 20, I think it's 2035. Um, so point one is that cloud computing is much, much more energy efficient. On AI itself, AI at the moment is incredibly energy intensive. It's, it's hugely energy intensive. But what I think is quite interesting, coming back to that point earlier on, is if these cloud um, data center providers can manage that appropriately through you know, using renewable energy, that's, that's really helpful. But then stage two is yes, it's almost like an upfront energy cost. You have a huge amount of cost to develop AI algorithms but as they get applied in the real economy, that's where the savings come through. If you think of that, say, Lindy example I gave earlier on. So it's almost like an upfront carbon cost before that, you know, it gets realized in huge savings over the coming years. And, you know, just what, what I think is quite interesting, you know, in this, in this current AI sort of buzz era is the speed with which AI innovation has impacted the real economy. It's happened incredibly quickly. And I draw a parallel with, say, cryptocurrency where if you think all the buzz around cryptocurrency four or five years ago, as far as I understand it, there's still no practical application for cryptocurrency. Whereas uh, almost immediately, all the companies I meet talk about applying AI in different ways in their business. Now, some of that, of course, will be them you know, using the buzzwords because they know they have to, but I get a good sense that it's actually impacting the real world sort of here and now, really. Great. So uh, in, in the beginning of uh, impact investing and sustainable investing, we've seen the negative screening. Then we, uh, I mean, we came to uh, the, the, the added value that you mentioned. How do you see uh, the sustainable investments for the next decade and how impacts will, will uh, I mean, be there? Yeah, so um, I guess sort of coming back to, 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 to the first point, you know, the reason why we do what we do is to generate better financial returns. That's first and foremost um, wh why, wh why we do that. And, you know, the, the reason why we see it's such a, you know, exciting long-term opportunity is really because there's sort of four key drivers for us in terms of driving us towards a more sustainable global economy. Um, the first I've touched on before, which is basically technology is improving, which is leading companies to adopt new technology, which is often more energy efficient. I gave the example of the automotive industry earlier on, so there's a big, big change happening there. Um, the second driver, which we think will play out over the next 10 years, is changing consumer preference. 
So if we think of, say, that automotive industry example, I think if you had gone back sort of nine years or so, very few people would entertain the idea of an electric car because you know they were too expensive, they, um, the range wasn't there, and where do you charge them? You know, these factors are very, very quickly becoming o overcome. And this pattern of changing consumer preference we see across different industries. You know, we talked about the food industry um, a, a, a little bit earlier on, but what I think is really interesting is if you look how many younger consumers buy their food products these days, they have much less brand loyalty. You know, kind of the previous generations would have had lots of loyalty to a Heinz or a Campbell's or, or, or those kind of brands. What I think is really interesting is now many particularly younger consumers will get the food product and they'll turn it around and just look at the ingredients sure. straight straight away. Mm -hmm. And they'll look at the amount of additives and things like that in. So consumer preference is changing across so many different areas. Um, I think the third thing, um, and we call this social factors, is companies are changing their behavior in response to consumers wanting different things. So, you know, take that automotive example again. The R&D roadmaps of all the big car companies are now tilted completely towards electric vehicle development because they've realized the technology is there, which is point one, and consumers will now, you know, accept that idea. So, you know, they're, they're, the, the companies are really changing their behavior and adopting some of those sustainable solutions. And I think also there's a general sense from many companies that, you know, th they need to understand kind of some of the externalities that their business produces. Um, and as, as an example of this, I saw an interview with the CEO of Unilever uh, a couple of years ago, um, and he was talking about, you know, the environmental profile of Unilever. And as, as we all know, Unilever is a very broad consumer staples company. It makes everything from washing detergent to Dove soaps and things like that. And he said something which really stuck in my mind, where he basically said he did not want Unilever to be known as the world's largest branded trash company. In other words, when you buy your Unilever detergent, you have a huge lump of plastic at the end of it. You know, Unilever can no longer say, I wash my hands of that now, it's not someone else's responsibility. They realize that they need to actually, you know, get involved in kind of some of the solutions, be it increasing circularity of, you know, packaging products, more easy to recycle plastic materials. Um, so all of these different areas are incredibly important. So, you know, companies we see across many sectors are changing their behaviors. Um, and then the final one is regulation. Um, you know, regulation is a very sort of powerful driver behind lots of these markets. You know, I mentioned earlier on about the food industry. Well, you know, if you say look at, say, the UK or California, there's actually a, 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 a sugar tax on carbonated soft drink consumption because of the associated healthcare costs of, you know, dental, um, dental work and things like that. So regulation is a very, very powerful driver. And, you know, touching on some of the comments we heard on, on the previous panel as well, if you think of the direction of regulation we've seen, particularly from the US over the last year or so, we've seen very, very large pieces of legislation. We've seen the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, we've seen the Inflation Reduction Act, we've seen the CHIPS Act. Lots of those areas actually really sort of feed into this opportunity over time as well. So the nearshoring of chip production, for example, we have you know, a significant amount of the portfolio which really um, sort of benefits from that. So, um, so if you take all those four factors together, technology getting better, consumers wanting different things, companies now offering different things and regulation being a powerful driver, we think for us it makes sense to invest on the right side of some of those transitions to generate better financial returns. Great. So we talked about sectors, we talked about trends. I would like to add the global uncertainty that we are living at. How, how you deal with that? Yeah, so um, I guess it maybe ties into that point I was making in terms of some of the um, stimulus spending we've seen in the US. You know, I, I guess it's all related to some of those, you know, deglobalization um, to um, topics we, we, we've heard earlier on. Um, generally, if you look at the uh, portfolio, we have significant portions of the portfolio which really benefit from that. So, you know, if you think of kind of the rising geopolitical uncertainty um, at the moment, maybe just zooming in on Europe. If you think of the geopolitical uncertainty which Europe faces with the Ukraine war on, on, on its doorstep, obviously what that has done is it's massively increased the attention and focus on energy independence. Because basically many European countries have realized that it's not really a stable situation to be reliant on Russia for all of your oil and gas needs essentially. So what does this mean? It means a huge amount of extra investment in things like energy efficient technology, which makes say, the grid more energy efficient, so we waste less electricity as, 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 it, um, as it flows around. Equipment which goes into buildings to make buildings more energy efficient. It can be renewable energy as well, although we don't have any exposure to renewable energy, but I still think there'll be you know, increased investment in that. So energy independence has increased on the uh, list of priorities enormously over recent times, and that really sort of benefits us as well. And then some of those other trends I mentioned, kind of the, the nearshoring of, of, of various productive um, 
um, um, industries, um, that is another area which we really benefit from, often in things like the uh, tech, tech industry, but also in the automotive industry. Um, you know, I mentioned some of these interesting trends going on there. As I said, we don't invest in, say, the likes of Tesla. We invest in companies that provide things like the electric vehicle architecture. All of those companies are benefiting from nearshoring because actually lots of them already have big manufacturing bases in Mexico, for example. So they're already almost ahead of the curve on that. So, um, so, so generally, if you think of the environment increasing, um, focus on energy independence, nearshoring, that all sort of really, really helps us, I think. And then just one final point I'll make on that, that as well is, as I mentioned, um, the fund stylistically is a quality fund. And what that means, if you were to look at the portfolio, the companies we invest in have higher returns than the overall market and lower levels of leverage as well. So the companies that we invest in are, have much lower levels of debt than the overall market. And if you think that we're you know, potentially entering this period of extended geopolitical uncertainty, generally what happens in times of uncertainty is investors really move towards those parts of the market they think are basically safer. Um, and essentially that's our focus really. Um, and so um, if we have got that period of you know, geopolitical volatility, I think you know, the fund again should be quite well, well positioned. Okay, when, when we are talking about illiquid assets, I mean, you manage, I mean, in a way, the company. I mean, you may not manage uh, directly, but indirectly via veto, for instance. When, when you have a liquid fund like yours, I mean, the management is not there, right? So, you, how do you engage with those companies? How close you are with those companies and how you, I mean, direct in a way? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I think just a point of clarification. So Impact does not regard itself as an impact investor. Um, for us, impact investing is basically getting involved with companies which are polluting or extractive and making them better actors within their space. I think that's an incredibly important thing to do. You know, 85% of the world's energy mix is still fossil fuels. That's the, the way it is. For us, that's really impact investing. Impacts, on the other hand of things, and we've done this now since 1998, has invested in companies that are on the right side of this transition. In other words, providing solutions to make um, industries more energy efficient or water, water efficient or, or, or whatever it might be. So investing on the right side is, is what, what we try to do. But having said that, engagement is a really important part of, of what we do. Um, I think one thing that has helped is that um, you know, impacts, because we've been around since 1998, um, we've established very strong relationships with many of our investee companies. Um, so th this fund, Global Opportunities, was seeded in 2015, but we've you know, managed other funds from that 1998. And what this means is we've kind of almost grown up with lots of the companies that, um, that are in this investment space. We've had 15, 18-year relationships with these companies, and they know that we are consistent long-term investors um, in, in their space. So that gives us, I think, really good access to, to, to the companies we invest in. But I think the other thing as well is when we look at the engagement that we do with companies, the reason why we engage with companies is really to understand how they are managing some of the risks that their business might face. It's not like a tick box exercise, it's trying to understand how they're coping with these, these issues. And so the issues that different companies might face will, will vary quite substantially, but as an, as an example, um, if you look at say some of the industrial companies in, in, in the portfolio, one of the key topics we engage with on our, um, for our industrial companies is cybersecurity. And the reason why that's so important is because if you look at what happened to the global economy during COVID, many businesses had to become digital first almost overnight. And why this was such a challenge for industrial companies in many cases is industrial companies historically have been companies that make a particular piece of machinery that goes into often a factory or an end market. All of a sudden, they were connected entities you know, that had this software platform overlying them. And what this means is many of these companies are not necessarily experts in the field of software. So what we're really try, keen to try to understand is how they've managed and improved their cyber security type um, uh, protections, because as we know, cyber hacking incidents are a really growing um, issue at the moment. So cyber um, um, approach to cyber security is one, one example. And I mean, a, a, another example as well, and this is maybe a bit more of a regional difference, is um, the governance structure of companies is incredibly important. Again, not for any tick box reasons, it's just because what we've noticed over time is that companies that have weaker governance structures often make strategic missteps because often what you'll find with companies with poorer governance is there will often be a dominant founder figure within that company who calls all the shots for that company and no one really challenges him or her to, in, in terms of that direction. So we engage very, very closely with our companies on governance issues 
Um, and one particular area, when it comes on the regional point, is often with Asian and particularly Japanese companies. Because Japanese companies, as a rule of thumb, will have very, very strong environmental standards, very, very strong social standards. It's the governance which often is the issue, where often with many Japanese companies, you'll find there's often a founder figure within the company. It's often an elderly gentleman, maybe in his 80s. I've met one in the 90s, actually, who was a chairman, who is still at the very center of the decision making for that company. And so what this means is basically there's not really enough refreshment of the board. And so what this can mean, I think, is you can miss out on new ideas as a company because you have the same group of people making decisions year in, year out. And so understanding things like board tenure, board refreshment, I think is incredibly important to understand the risk that you take with, a, with an investment. And what metrics do you use, I mean, to, to measure the sustainability of the company? Is, is there a model or something like that? Yes, so, so, so we've done, um, I would say, very thorough uh, reporting on the impacts of investing in our, in our, in our portfolios. Um, so this can be things like carbon data. Um, so we look at um, sort of gross and net carbon. We look at the uh, aggregate uh, position of the portfolio in terms of scope one, two, and three emissions. Scope three is the area that takes a lot of improvement at the moment. But I think on that carbon data, which we have reported, I think, since 2008 in different funds at, at, at impacts, I think a really important point to take away is it's really, really central to look at the net carbon that a company produces, not the gross carbon. And why that's so important is because if you think of some of the sustainability challenges we have, often those challenges are met by industrial companies that make particular products you know, and, and, and bits of machinery. And the, real, the key takeaway here is you have to emit carbon to save carbon. You could have an incredibly low carbon portfolio by investing in a bunch of tech companies that are software companies that don't emit any carbon, they'll look fantastic for your metrics, but you know, they're not rolling their sleeves up and actually getting involved in solving some of these, um, some of these problems. So um, I think it's quite interesting that in some of the other funds we run at, at Impacts, which have many more industrial companies, um, the gross carbon profile is very high, the net carbon is, is much, much lower. And what net carbon means, for those that aren't so familiar, is net carbon means how much carbon is saved through the application of that particular product in its end market. Um, and if it's helpful, just one small example there. If you say take a company that makes roof insulation material, what we do at Impacts is we calculate how much carbon is emitted in the production of that roof insulation material, and then we net that off against the amount of energy which is saved through the application of that insulation material in a residential house for a one year period. And that's how you get to the net carbon position. So that's just um, probably a bit too much detail on the, um, on, on the carbon, but we also report across a range of different metrics, things like UN Sustainable Development Goal Alignment. Um, so there's lots and lots of data in there, but I think it's a, a really important point to, to uh, finish on this one, is that this is an outcome from the process. We don't target a certain amount of carbon um, a profile less than the broader market. And the reason why we don't is because from my perspective, it can be an incredibly dangerous thing to say that this fund will eliminate, uh, will uh, have a carbon profile which is 10% better than the market. And the reason why I say it's dangerous is because, as I said, what we're trying to do is generate better financial returns. Now, when I'm looking at the portfolio of 40 stocks in, in global opportunities, I know there are some companies in there that avoid a huge amount of carbon. Now, if I had a certain target to have 10% less carbon than the overall market, maybe it would impact my investment decision to not sell that company or buy that company because I know that if that company leaves the portfolio, then the carbon profile of the strategy is, you know, is, 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 is challenged. And so for, for me, it's so important that that's the outcome from the process, not a straight up target. Now, by the nature of the uh, opportunity set, we will always, I think, have quite a favorable carbon profile, but it's not a certain target in terms of you know, set in stone number. Super interesting. We are approaching the end of the panel, so I would like to give you um, two minutes to, to give a final remarks. Um, I, th I think we've probably sort of covered, covered most of it, actually. I think, it's, um, I think it's just to the point that, you know, the reason why Impacts does what it does is because we believe you can generate better financial returns by capturing these opportunities and avoiding these risks. Um, at the company level, so the companies we invest in, the reason why they adopt sustainable technology is again not through altruistic reasons, it's because they save themselves costs, which is a really, really important sort of key point to make. And I think if you look at sort of like the big top down things we're seeing in the world at the moment, the energy independence getting going up the agenda, nearshoring, 
lots of these areas really sort of play into that area. And I think one other area which we sort of touched on as well, healthcare is, an, is going to be a key area for investment globally over the next 10 years. You know, the, the need to discover more effective drugs is incredibly powerful. Now, that area is going through a bit of a low at the moment. Um, the reason why is because we had a huge pull forward in demand during the COVID period when you know, many, many companies were trying to discover a vaccine for COVID, so instrumentation demand went up. And also during that period of zero interest rates, there was a big pull forward in demand because basically when interest rates were zero, you probably are aware of the number of biotech companies that were trying to discover drug molecules. Honestly, like a lot of bad science was funded back then. But having said that, you know, the need to you know, discover those more effective drugs hasn't gone away. You know, if you look at how treatment types are changing over time with innovations such as cell and gene therapy, mRNA, these new treatment, what are called modalities are emerging all the time. And if you think just last year, Alzheimer's has emerged as a treatment type for the first time. Alzheimer's was really the holy grail of drug discovery because it's really difficult to discover a drug that you can prove works for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So it's just to the point that all the time, new drug innovations are coming out to you know, solve some of these issues. And we think it's a really exciting area to invest in. And you know, as an example, within Global Opportunities, about 12% of the portfolio is aligned with that whole you know, innovation in, in healthcare drug discovery, which I'm you know, say really excited about. Thank you so much for the super interesting panel, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mariana. Thank you.